I think it's time for this toxic, binary, zero-sum madness to stop. We're not an imperial power. We're a revolutionary power. We are no longer in a world where you can plot out moves, statesman to statesman, like a chessboard. You don't know anything about my background or where I came from. It doesn't matter to you because fundamentally I'm a mean white man. We can't do this to the next generation because America will cease to exist. Welcome to the Monk Debates podcast. Every episode, we provide you with a civil and substantive debate on the big issues of the day, free of spin, focused on the facts, and animated by smart conversation to arm you, the listener, with enough information to make up your own mind. Today's debate, be it resolved, the reintroduction of shutdowns needs to be considered in U.S. states where COVID infections are surging. It has been another deadly day in the fight against COVID-19. Georgia also surpassing a milestone of 200,000 total confirmed ICU beds cases. in Mississippi are full. One hospital describing its staff as stretched thin, exhausted, and running on fumes. Meanwhile, doctors... COVID-19 warning- cases continue to rise in Illinois. This is the highest number since the end of May. Right now, more than... Take a look at the map. Deaths are rising in 35 states and Puerto Rico. California reporting a record 219 deaths and more than 500,000 cases. Hello, I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. More than 5 million cases, over 160,000 deaths and counting. The United States currently leads the global tally for the highest number of COVID-19 cases. California, an early success story, has aggressively rolled back the reopening of schools and businesses. Louisiana, Idaho, Texas, and Nevada are among dozens of states experiencing surging case counts, rising hospitalizations, and increased deaths. Meanwhile, some countries, originally devastated by the coronavirus, are successfully reopening after driving new infections down to manageable levels. When public health policies such as physical distancing, hand washing, masks, and increased testing can't bend the curve in new infections, some say the only way to prevent tens of thousands of new deaths is a second wave of shutdowns targeting the hardest hit areas. If we prematurely end that physical distancing and the other measures, keeping it at bay, deaths could skyrocket into the hundreds of thousands, if not a million. We cannot return to normal until there's a vaccine. Conferences, concerts, sporting events, religious services, dinner in a restaurant, none of that will resume until we find a vaccine, a treatment, or a cure. Critics say with shutdowns, the supposed cure is worse than the disease. Millions will be denied essential medical treatment, including mental health. Jobs and businesses will be permanently lost, and closed schools will prevent a much-needed return for children and parents alike. Shutdowns are not the answer to the ongoing threat of COVID-19. We have to remember that there's another side to this. Keeping them out of school and keeping work closed is causing death also. Economic harm, but causing death for different reasons, but death, probably more death. On this installment of the Monk Debates podcast, we challenge the essence of these arguments by debating the motion, be it resolved, the reintroduction of shutdowns needs to be considered in U.S. states where COVID-19 infections are surging. Arguing for the motion is Andrew Neumer, an epidemiologist, population health scientist at the University of California, Irvine, where he specializes in infectious disease mortality. He is an associate professor in the university's Department of Population Health and Disease Prevention. Arguing against the motion is epidemiologist John Ioannidis, the C.F. Renborg Chair in Disease Prevention, Professor of Medicine of Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford. He is co-director of the university's Meta Research Innovation Center, Metrics. Andrew, John, welcome to the Monk Debates podcast. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the kind invitation. Well, I'm really looking forward to uh, this debate today. I think if we had to think of one of the critical issues, both in terms of public policy, public health, it is what should the response be going forward as the United States and many other countries around the world confront surging COVID-19 infections. And to have two people with your experience and knowledge of epidemiology of uh, this particular virus is a privilege indeed. We're going to debate today 
be it resolved, the reintroduction of shutdowns needs to be considered in U.S. states where COVID-19 infections are surging. Andrew, you're going to be speaking in favor of the motion on today's debate. So let's have your opening statement, please. Thank you uh, for having me on your podcast. I have been following this pandemic closely, and I regularly tweet my thoughts on the pandemic as it evolves. My Twitter is at Andrew Neumer. And this health crisis is unprecedented in our lifetime, and it needs to be taken seriously. Nothing since the 1918 influenza pandemic really compares to it in terms of scope, potential impact. And shutdowns or shelter in place or lockdowns is something that nobody wants. But I do believe that they may be necessary in some cases in the United States as we head into the fall of 2020. I am not arguing today in favor of a blanket nationwide shutdown, but on a state-by-state basis or a county-by-county basis, where the data justify it, I believe a reimposition of shelter-in-place is something that in some cases will be necessary and certainly may be necessary in some places. We need to lower the boil. The pandemic is boiling over in many locations in the United States, and we need to turn off the heat. There are different ways to do that, but the most effective way is to go into another shutdown. The problem is that masking works and social and physical distancing work, but epidemics are path-dependent processes, meaning doing something at the start and doing something in the middle does not have the same effect, even if you're doing the same thing. So masking, if we had all masked early on, we would be in a different place now than if we all start masking now, because the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. And the pandemic so far is something that we have consistently underestimated. We have approaching 200,000 deaths in the United States today. These are excess deaths. So these are real deaths. These are not robbing Peter to pay Paul in terms of mortality. So this is an epidemic that is serious, and we need to approach it cautiously. Sorry, I wanted to add that I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you for that succinct and and focused opening statement. Uh, John, you're speaking against our motion, be it resolved, the reintroduction of shutdowns needs to be considered in U.S. states where COVID-19 infections are surging. Let's hear your argument against uh, what Andrew has just proposed. There's no doubt that we are dealing with a major crisis, both in health and with reverberations across our society. We need to act decisively. We need to act promptly. We need to act with precision We need to act in a way that will optimize our chances of saving lives and also minimizing the harms, both from the pandemic and from the measures that we have to take. Shutdowns are an extreme measure. We know very well that they have tremendous harms. They have tremendous harms on people, on their lives, on their health, on their mental health, on their ability to get the best care for major problems like heart attacks, like cancer care. They can take a major toll on unemployment. They can take a major toll on leaving people who are disadvantaged even more disadvantaged. It protects some of us who have the means to shelter, but it lets essential workers, it lets disadvantaged populations pretty much unprotected. Does it have any benefits? There's some data that suggests benefits, but as we will discuss, most of these data suggest that the benefits are actually modeling artifacts. They're not real. Do we have effective measures to deal with the crisis? We do. We have many measures to deal effectively with lowering the caseload and decreasing the deaths that uh, would ensue from them. We know far more than when this pandemic started. We know whom to protect. We know where are the settings that are the disaster potential, like nursing homes that account for 40 to 65 of all deaths, both in the US and in Europe, like nosocomial infections like high-risk individuals that we need to protect with very draconian measures. We know how to act with precision, and we should do that rather than just destroying our entire society, our entire country, and eventually also the entire world, because much depends also on what the U.S. is doing. I need to add also that I have no conflicts of interest either. Thank you. 
Thank you, John, for that opening statement. So just for the benefit of our listeners, let me just quickly summarize your respective opening arguments here. Andrew, you're saying, I think it's an interesting idea that there's little utility at this point in trying to, uh, halfway through a pandemic, uh, reinstitute measures, which the science seems to suggest could be effective, for instance, masking. John, you're saying that the the detrimental effects on mental health, on physical health, on the economy need to be weighed here when we're considering shutdowns. Do shutdowns really work? Do they provide the kind of panacea in terms of stopping the virus cold or certainly regressing its growth that proponents of shutdowns have argued. So let's move on to our rebuttals now. And this is an opportunity for you both to react to each other's opening statements. Andrew, let's have a couple minutes on the clock for you to reflect on what John has said off the top. So I just want to clarify one point about masking. What I intended to mean is that masking and other measures are not something that are uh, of no use now. It's just that the effect they have when people start masking in the middle of a, a epidemic and the effect that masking has if it had been started at the start of the epidemic are not the same. So I absolutely am a proponent of masking and other physical and, as it's sometimes called, social distancing. I just think that right now that's not enough. The issue uh, is that I don't believe that precision measures are working in the United States right now. They work, on, in my opinion, on paper, but in, in some cases, some states will need, or at least some counties of some states, will need to go back to some sort of shutdown slash shelter in place. It's, it's one thing to say that, you know, we know how to stop this precisely, but these measures don't seem to be working in the United States. We have over 50,000 new confirmed cases a day every day in the United States and, and over 1,000 deaths being recorded on weekdays, it's not sustainable. We, we need a reset. Once we get the reset through a shelter in place, we can go to precision measures. But in certain places, we need a reset. I'm not in favor of a national lockdown because that would be ridiculous. There are, there are plenty of states that are in, either in lulls or have gotten the pandemic under control or some of both. But shelter in place needs to be a weapon in our arsenal because precision measures are not working. There's plenty of community transmission now, particularly in the West and South. It is not just a question of nursing homes, although I agree that the mortality has been concentrated there. We're not destroying society by doing a three-week or six-week shelter in place. That is a straw man. We didn't destroy society when we did it the first time around, and we will not destroy society when we do it the second time around. You know, we could have a million deaths from COVID-19 in the United States. We certainly are headed very quickly to 200,000. So it's a very serious situation. You know, serious measures need to be on the table. It's a matter of what works in the real world, not what works in theory. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, interesting rebuttal points there. So, John, your opportunity now to react to Andrew's opening statement or, or what he's just said in, in response to your opening bid in this debate. I think that uh, I fully agree with, with Andrew that we're dealing with a serious problem and that our priority should be to try to save as many lives as possible. We just need to look at the full big picture, though. And I think that uh, lockdown and shutdowns have not really worked in the past. I think that they did cause tremendous harm. I think if you look at uh, multiple indicators of, uh, of health, at multiple indicators of societal well-being, of economy, of unemployment, uh, they have been devastating, uh, both in this country and elsewhere. Do we have a large number of cases? Yes, we do. I, actually, I would argue we have far more than 50,000. Uh, we just do some testing and we're missing many, many more. So probably the number of cases is far, far more than what we are detecting. However, even with increased testing, we do see that even in these hot epicenters that are still brewing, the number of cases is going down. If you look at California, Texas, Florida, the number of cases, even with increased uptake of testing, has peaked around uh, July 12th to 22nd and has been uh, plateauing and uh, going down since then. If you look at deaths that uh, follow the peak in cases uh, uh, by a couple of weeks, uh, they're also starting to go down. So it's a little bit after the fact. Uh, actually, the, 
the time that we diagnose cases is not when they when people get infected. It's it's already a week. Sometimes it may be much more than a week. It could be even several weeks or or a month and a half after people have been infected. So I think that shutdown at this point would make no sense. Even the claimed benefits of uh, lockdown in some modeling studies, as I said, they seem to be modeling artifacts. Imperial College in London released a COVID-19 report, and that's where most of our U.S. leaders are getting the information they're basing their decision-making on. The report runs us through a few different ways this could turn out, depending on what our responses are. If you take the Imperial College model that suggested that uh, millions of lives were saved in Europe by uh, shutdowns and uh, lockdowns, if you use their own model that they applied to the U.S., you see that there's no benefit. So... Lockdown and shutdown is a nuclear weapon that destroys everything other than doing what it's supposed to do. Thank you, John. Now's the opportunity for us to kind of move through, I think, some of the key issues that are going to be on our listeners' minds as they engage with this podcast. And I think first and foremost there is what parents and school boards and others are confronting right now, which is the return of millions of children across North America to the classroom. And Andrew, I know this is something you've you've written and you're thinking about a lot. Talk to us a bit about how you could see potentially the return of children to school, the effect of that having on this pandemic, and uh, your views as to how that could spill out in terms of the need possibly for lockdowns, shelter in place as a policy response to the possibility of a surge in cases as a result of the return of the educational system. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, school is going to be starting again soon. And K-12 education and also even, indeed, higher education strategies are are probably the most complex and most important policy problem before us right now, as this podcast is being recorded in August 2020. I don't have easy answers for what to do with K-12 schools, but I do have some important thoughts. First of all, schools are so important for building uh, educational and social capital in young people. And closing schools or changing schools such that they're done remotely is not uh, something to be done lightly. I am not worried that we will have lots and lots of sick children if school proceeds in a business as usual model, because the data are clear and the kids for the vast, 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 vast majority of cases do not get sick and certainly do not get severely ill when they are infected with SARS-CoV-2. But kids, we know, can be infected. They just don't show symptoms very much. And we know from a recent summer camp study in the state of Georgia, USA, that they can transmit to each other and they can transmit to adults. First tonight, a CDC report details a major COVID-19 outbreak at an overnight summer camp in North Georgia. More than 200 campers and staff tested positive after attending the YMCA's Camp High Harbor in Braben County. So my fear is that kids will inadvertently be a catalyst for a fall wave of COVID-19. So I'm worried about adults who work in education teachers, teachers' aides, school nurses, school administrators, and I'm worried about adults who share households with school-aged children, parents principally, but, you know, in multi-generational households or et cetera, et cetera. So we know that respiratory diseases are seasonal with a winter dominance. We see this in tuberculosis. We see this in measles. We see this in respiratory syncytial virus. We see this in influenza. We have every reason to believe that we'll see the same pattern in the temperate Northern Hemisphere with COVID-19. And believe it or not, kids are one of the reasons why many diseases are thought to be seasonal because K through 12 education catalyzes the seasonal epidemics. It's, It's one of the theories of why diseases are so seasonal. So I'm worried that starting school in some cases will catalyze the epidemic and create second waves There are enormous benefits of school going beyond education, including nutrition, including the general welfare of kids and the role that schools play, let's be honest, in de facto childcare for uh, working families. So it's an incredibly thorny problem, but very sick parents uh, is also uh, a very thorny problem. 
It's a complicated issue. And let, let, let's have you, John, weigh in on schools, because in some ways it goes to the heart of this debate that we're having, which is about shutdowns as a tool. And have we, in a sense, moved forward with school openings across North America preemptively without a case count at a low enough level to do this safely? I think that schools are an extremely important component in solving that difficult equation. And I, I fully agree with uh, with Andrew on many points. I, I think that you mentioned all the major benefits that uh, we reap from, from schools, from education. Many kids cannot really afford nutrition other than what is given to them uh, through the school system. Integration into society. Parents, their lives would be tremendously disrupted, let alone their health, by having schools continue to be closed. Our whole society is disrupted if uh, our educational system is not functioning. So I think that there's a lot at stake. And at the same time, as Andrew mentioned, kids do not really have uh, any chance of, of dying from that disease with very, very, very rare exceptions. I think that uh, if you look at the number of things that can go wrong in our lives for children to, to have serious disease or to die, COVID-19 is extremely low down the list. So I think that the, the main issue we need to debate, because it seems we agree on everything else, is, is to what extent kids would possibly infect vulnerable adults and, and therefore lead to a higher death load. And I, I think that this is where I would uh, disagree with Andrew. I think that uh, we have evidence from dozens and hundreds of super spreader events and from disaster situations where COVID-19 has massacred uh, large uh, numbers of people. And we don't have in that list situations that have originated from schools. We know that uh, kids, yes, uh, they tend to be infected and they tend to be asymptomatic. Uh, they may transmit the virus, but it's not to a level that would be of such concern that uh, would lead to, to disasters. I, I think that they're uh, one of the least likely type of transmission that would affect uh, the highly vulnerable individuals. At the same time, I recognize that we need to allow for maybe that five or 10 percent of kids where they would have highly vulnerable individuals within their immediate environment that, you know, that they live with them like every day uh, in the same house and they cannot avoid uh, but live with them. And we should have some way that we would allow for uh, a small proportion to join the class uh, remotely. And I think that we can be flexible. I think that we can be precise about that. I think it's unrealistic that uh, we will shut down our educational system for everyone and suffer all these major consequences on all of these fronts uh, while we can do things much more targeted for situations where we have uh, the need to intervene. The same applies also to a few kids that may have serious diseases themselves, and they may be at high risk. Of course, we need to find ways to integrate them in our educational experience, and you know, probably they would need to protect themselves more. But we shouldn't use the nuclear option. We shouldn't just destroy our educational system. We shouldn't just destroy the lives of children, parents, many of them very disadvantaged. Every movement in the shutdown direction is just causing more inequality. Thank you, John. I, I want to kind of pivot back to what I think has emerged as the one of the key points of disagreement between you, which is, uh, John, your feeling that there are a set of, quote, precision responses here that can be implemented, that can be effective in at least mitigating the continued surge of the virus. And Andrew, you're saying that those precision responses haven't really work to date. And that's why we're seeing this virus explode, uh, especially across uh, the continental US. So, Andrew, can you go a little bit deeper on that? Because I think, you know, John is channeling the frustration of a lot of people to shut downs or shelter in place is that they do seem like a nuclear option. They do seem like a response that isn't calibrated, ham-fisted, and causes all of these, you know, secondary and third and fourth level effects that have profound negative consequences for public health, the very thing that shutdown or lockdown or shelter in place is supposedly supposed to address. Let's go a little bit deeper on that, Andrew. Sure. And I don't want to sort of destroy 
society in order to save it. But I do recognize that that would be a caricature way to see the position I'm arguing. I'm not arguing that we blanket shut down right away and everywhere, but I'm not principally a modeler. I'm not relying on the Imperial College model for my arguments uh, in favor of shutdowns. I also wanted to add, I'm not just worried about uh, death. This is a new virus known to science, so we don't know what the long-term sequelae are, but I am worried about uh, long-term consequences for those who survive. I think it's important for the listeners at home to understand that death is not the only severe outcome. Like I said, I don't want to um, I don't want to crush society to to save it. And you know, the reason we care about improving people's health is because that's a Im- very important component of their overall welfare. You know, we don't want to reduce other dimensions of people's welfare just for the health dimension. But there are ways we can approach, you know, this. I don't want to say we can have our cake and eat it too, but, you know, and, and it's not going to come without some cost, but it may be possible, for example, for, for children to repeat this school year. Now, that's not without tremendous logistical problems because we'll have to do, instead of K through 12, we'll have to do K through 13. Uh, so it's going to take, you know, outside the box thinking, but uh, it won't be a detriment to kids to repeat a year if everyone is repeating a year. We can find ways to deal with situations like that, but we don't know how to uh, bring someone back who died of COVID-19. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so, John, similar question back to you, but I want to focus on on Melbourne because Melbourne right now is is a, a really interesting experiment that's underway in terms of a, a large city of over 5 million people that has been shut down for the next six weeks. Now, Melbourne in Australia is back in lockdown because of a spike in COVID cases. Stay at home means just that. This is, I know, further than we went last time, but we are in many respects in a more precarious, challenging uh, and potentially tragic position now than we were some months ago. So part of the reason or the rationale for the shutdown in Melbourne was just the lack of compliance, that people weren't following social distancing rules. Uh, masks weren't being worn according to, to guidelines. Uh, contact tracing, uh, people don't call back the contact tracer, uh, something which seems supposedly quite prevalent uh, in the United States. So John, talk to us about Melbourne and, and again, why you think that these precision mechanisms can work in the real world. Some people would say all that human behavior kind of suggests that shutdowns, lockdowns is really the only tool that works. I think that there's no doubt that uh, for any measure in medicine and in public health, there is a difference between its theoretical uh, benefit, uh, its uh, efficacy, and what it can achieve uh, in terms of effectiveness in real life. So, you know, hand washing works, uh, wearing masks in proper situations works, social distancing has some benefit in given settings, avoiding mass gatherings has a benefit. But as you say, none of them is implemented 100% with perfection. But the very same thing applies to shutdown. When we're saying shutdown or lockdown or complete lockdown, uh, in fact, a very large segment of the society continues to work and be exposed actually to very high risk. And it's usually disadvantaged people Essential workers are heroes. They're working for us. They get exposed in high-risk jobs that we cannot really live without them. From the very beginning of our discussion, I mentioned that what I do care about is saving lives. I don't think that shutdowns are saving lives. I think that they're killing people, and they're killing some people immediately, but they're killing even more kind of in the midterm or long-term through the consequences of all of these disasters on multiple fronts of public health, of society, of well-being, of mental health, of violence, of people just uh, getting crazy. It's become an all too familiar scene at the intersection of coronavirus and gun violence in Chicago. It's compared to last year. An uptick in domestic violence cases as stay at home orders force victims into close quarters with abusers and make escape. But people have stayed home for myriad reasons, even if it meant ignoring chest pain. I think that there's just too many harms. Now, could it be that we have a vaccine and therefore just shutting down everything and waiting for the vaccine to save us? I believe vaccines are are like one of the greatest achievements of humans, of, of, of science. But despite some promising results, we're not going to have a vaccine in six weeks. We're not going to have one for wide distribution 
even in six months. We will be lucky if we have it within a year or two years. So what are we going to do? Are we going to go for shutdowns for how long? Even a few weeks can be devastating. Doing it again, I think will be more devastating than the first time. We just need to focus where we need to focus. It's unacceptable, for example, not to test all the personnel in nursing homes and all the people who are residents there. It is unacceptable not to test our healthcare workers in hospitals when we know that they can have devastating impact through asymptomatic infections on people who are hospitalized and uh, are at very high risk of having a severe outcome. Instead, we're thinking of locking down little kids and healthy adults and people like me who will be enjoying it doing research and publishing papers. I think it's just, just the wrong recipe. It's destroying society and it's destroying also the most vulnerable and the most disadvantaged people among us. Thank you, John. Before I go to closing statements, I, I just want to have you both weigh in on one more important issue that I think is top of mind for listeners, which is this certainly uh, wasn't our first global pandemic and it's not going to be our last. So what have we learned to apply to next time? Andrew, what have we learned? Yeah, thanks. I just want to touch on something John said, because I think it's important for the listeners, because he and I are in agreement. And I, I think, you know, where he and I agree um, is, is probably something where people can really pay attention because we have such different takes on, on this that uh, where we overlap, I think, is a sign of consensus. And that is that uh, I don't believe the vaccine will be here in six weeks and probably not in six months and maybe not uh, even in 12 and so uh, I tweeted a long time ago, the point of these lockdowns is not to save ourselves, you know, for our big vaccine night, uh, you know, one that may never in fact come. The point of the lockdowns is just sort of to lower the heat. As we, as we approach uh, COVID-19 in the fall, I, th I think the average person needs to bear in mind that the vaccine is probably not imminent. This is a really important point you're making. You know, Dr. Anthony Fauci in the last couple of a week or so has been saying quite definitively, we will have a vaccine by the end of the year. Vaccine, as you know, there are multiple candidates that are in various stages of clinical trial. So we're pretty cautiously optimistic that at the end of the year, beginning of this coming 2021, we will have one and maybe more, I hope more than one vaccine that would be available. I mean, what do you think of that public messaging around those types of comments? I've been, uh, I'm skeptical of, uh, of presaging the results of a, of a clinical trial before the results are in. Anthony Fauci has been a, a public health leader for a very long time, and uh, he's just an amazing scientist, but even he doesn't have a crystal ball and cannot see the results of a phase three vaccine trial before they're in. And vaccines have to be safe, effective, available, and affordable. And so let's not call the outcome of the trial before the results are in. But to get to your question about what, what do we do in 2030 or what do we do the next time? I think we need stronger public health institutions. The pandemic was a very politicized, and I don't just mean electoral politics in the US. I mean, the World Health Organization dragged their feet on declaring a pandemic, which cost you know, a lot of time and, and it really set the wrong tone early on. And so we need stronger institutions and not just at the, at the World Health Organization in Geneva, but in the United States. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has uh, really been a disappointment in this pandemic. We need stronger federal leadership. We need the federal government to coordinate among the states. We need the CDC to step in and be the public health resource that it can be. So what we need are, uh, among other things, are strong, resilient public health institutions that can play a coordinating role so that we're not just all wandering around like headless chickens wondering what to do. And Andrew, a, a lockdown is the initial response to the threat? I think John may disagree with me, but I think a, a more comprehensive lockdown um, early on, you know, could have saved uh, a lot of pain now. And... Uh, you know, doing things now once the genie's out of the bottle and doing things in the early stages when we can nip things in the bud do not have the same effect because epidemics are nonlinear phenomena. So uh, 
I'm not saying, uh, you know, it's, it's futile to do things now. We should all be social distancing and masking. And, and I do share uh, John's concern that, uh, about disparate impact, that when we do these so-called lockdowns, they're not actually no, uh, a lockdown. They're, they're still essential workers. And we know in the United States context that essential workers are disproportionately people of color. And so uh, we're disproportionately exposing socially economic disadvantaged people and people of color to uh, a risk. So that's a concern. But I also do worry that uh, as we open up, it seems like you go from the frying pan to the fire, because as we open up, people of color are facing the brunt of the disease burden. So inequalities in health are not flattering to American society. And it's something that the pandemic is bringing into sharp relief. But I I don't see that uh, it's necessarily an argument one way or the other in terms of how to approach the pandemic, because we're seeing these uh, inequalities no matter which way you slice it. Thanks, Andrew. So, John, final question for you before we go to closing statements. Would you recommend, again, we don't know the nature of the pathogen, but if if we're confronted by something similar to COVID-19 in the future, would you recommend lockdown as an initial response, both on the basis of the precautionary principle and on, if you look at possibly the example of China, as something that seems to be quite effective in terms of allowing a meaningful reopening of the economy of Chinese schools. I mean, People are enjoying movie theaters in Beijing today, something I'm not able to do. I would be very cautious in interpreting the the data from China. Uh, There's no doubt that the number of infections is uh, vastly larger than the number of infections that were documented. And even the number of deaths may be off. The Chinese have revised these numbers, but I think that they are still pretty suboptimal compared to the reality. I don't think that really lockdown was uh, what worked in China. I think that the lockdown happened after the epidemic wave had peaked. Uh, My colleague at Stanford, Michael Levitt, has shown uh, pretty convincingly looking at the epidemic wave curves and modeling them with Gombert's functions that this might be the case, uh, both in China and, and in other places. Would I go for lockdown in other future pathogens? First of all, we need to survive uh, COVID-19. And I I really worry that uh, even though human civilization will not disappear because of COVID-19 itself, I think that our society and our world and our civilization can really have tremendous harm if we don't really use proper measures to, to deal with that. If we have a new pathogen, I think that we need to mobilize science as quickly as possible. We need to mobilize public health. To mobilize public health, we need to have public health. And unfortunately, public health, as Andrew mentioned, has uh, really not been uh, given enough attention over the years. And I think that we need to strengthen our public health institutions. They should be given priority. Our prioritization in medicine so far over the years is to spend 20 percent almost of our GDP in this country uh, trying to uh, create medicine that is extremely expensive and not really helping too many people. It is medicine that is not offering health to everyone. It leaves many people outside uh, with no health care, with no access to some minimum uh, prevention and therapeutic options. So we need to buttress public health. We should see more preparedness. We should see our hospitals really be ready to deal with it. Will we be able to get a vaccine faster, even faster than what we're trying to do now? I have great respect for Tony Fauci. I really love him. He's my hero. Uh, He's a giant. And I hope that he proves right and that we do get this vaccine soon. But we cannot promise that we will get a vaccine for a pathogen that we don't have a vaccine already. And I think that when we get the next pathogen in 2025 or 2035, we just cannot promise that. We will do our best, but we need to depend on public health and we need to depend on smart knowledge, learning about the virus, learning about who it attacks, who it kills, how does it do that, where do we need to focus our our protection and our measures? When COVID-19 hit, we knew very little. We, we, We thought that this would be like 1918. It is not. It is a devastation, but it has nothing to do compared to 1918. It's very comparable to probably 1957, 1958, or 1968, 1969. We had somewhere between one to four million deaths in these years. And I hope that we do not get to that level with COVID-19, but, but we should do our best 
to really save every life that we can save, both for COVID-19 and learning on what we did right and also what we did wrong to prepare for the next virus or the next pathogen. You're listening to the Monk Debates podcast. If you like this podcast, check out our other episodes, including debates on everything from the U.S. election to the future of globalization to whether it's time to defund the police. All free to download or stream on our website, monkdebates.com. Let's go to uh, closing statements now. This is an opportunity just to wrap up any final thoughts you want to leave with our our listeners, points of agreement, disagreement. The podium is yours. Uh, Andrew, we're going to start with you for your closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, John and I obviously have some differences of opinion uh, on the fine points, but I I think uh, he would agree that we're both on the same side that we want to reduce the disease burden of COVID-19. We're in the summer now in the Northern Hemisphere, where the United States is and where, where the most of, of, of the world's population lives. And, you know, the, these respiratory pathogens are winter dominant. You know, we see this over and over again with different viral pathogens that infect the respiratory tract. So I am very apprehensive about the fall as we head into winter. And I think it's too early to say that this won't be 1918. I mean, I, I don't believe uh, the overall mortality uh, and other impacts of this pandemic will will quite approach 1918, even in the worst case scenario. So that's good news and perhaps a point of agreement. But I think it remains to be seen whether or not uh, the overall burden of COVID-19 will be the same as uh, 1957 flu pandemic or the 1968-69 flu pandemic. I I just think it's, it's too early to call. And, you know, we need every weapon in our arsenal. I'm not saying that you, you people in Maryland or you people in Illinois are going to need to lock down right away. But I am saying that, you know, shutdowns for three to six weeks to reduce the boil over, you know, may be something that, that need, needs to be a weapon in our arsenal. We shouldn't take it off the table. People need to understand it. we need to steel ourselves for the fall wave. We need to prepare for the worst, hope for the best. And when we're preparing for the worst, we need every arrow in in our quiver and shutdowns as regrettable as they are and as deleterious as they are in terms of other impacts and I'm not ignoring those even net of you know the other problems that shutdowns cause they may save more lives and cause less disease burden in the long run and we need to constantly try to get the upper hand on this uh, pandemic or else it will hurt us and we, there are plenty of people who said this is going to kill less than flu. And it's already taken the lives of 160,000 Americans. These are real deaths. These are not uh, just borrowing deaths from heart attacks. The numbers show that we have increased mortality in the United States in calendar year 2020 relative to expectations. So it's a very serious situation. And it's been a pleasure you know, discussing the points with Professor Ioannidis and he and I, you know, differ on a lot of things. We also agree on a lot of things. And I I wish all the listeners health and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, John, we're going to give you the last word uh, in this debate. Uh, Take us home. It it was a great pleasure to debate with uh, Andrew on this topic and to hear his uh, insights. I think that we agree on 90% of uh, what we discussed. the, The major point where we disagree is whether shutdown should be on the table. I think they should not. I think that we have enough evidence that they can be devastating. It is a blind measure. It is kind of a medieval measure. Uh, it's, it's the equivalent of just uh, cutting your arm because you have some joint pain in your hand. And I, I think that we should just not repeat this. We know far more about this virus. We know far more about who it affects, where it kills, where it strikes hard, whom to protect, what to do we should struggle to really implement all this knowledge towards saving lives. I think that shutdown really protects those who do not necessarily need to be protected. It destroys those who have no risk. It destroys those who have risk. I think that it creates far more problems than we have. I don't think that this will be 1918. Of course, every virus can come back, uh, even for influenza. Every year it kills about 300 to 800 thousand people. 
We don't know whether this year is going to be a good year or a bad year. Same thing for COVID-19. I think we should prepare for the worst. And I think that we should use the knowledge that we have to protect those people in those settings where we can make a difference. We haven't done that. You know, surprisingly, we haven't done that. We still have people dying in nursing homes, in hospitals. We have disadvantaged people dying. And at the same time, we could avoid many of these deaths. So it is a major problem. We should do our best, but please don't shut down the world. Thank you, John. And thank you, uh, Andrew. This is, uh, as I said at the outset of this debate, this is the big issue. I think we're all debating going into the autumn and both of you have brought civility and substance to this conversation in service of our audience and expanding our knowledge and awareness of these vital issues. So on behalf of the Monk Debates community, thank you for coming on the Monk Debate podcast today. A million thanks for organizing this. Thank you for having both of us. Well, that wraps up today's debate. I want to thank Andrew Neumer and John Ioannidis for a terrific, thoughtful discussion of one of the big known unknowns of our time. How will we control COVID-19 until, if and when, we get a vaccine that works? Well, we've certainly dug into that issue today with some interesting food for thought. I know I'm going to be thinking about this debate for days to come. Remember, the Monk Debates podcast is that special place for civil and substantive debate on the big issues of the day. To listen to more debates on everything from how COVID-19 is changing cities to the growing geopolitical rivalry between China and the United States to big topics like the future of human progress, visit our website, monkdebates.com. You can also find show notes on today's debate. Thank you for helping us bring back the art of public debate one conversation at a time. I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. The Monk Debates are produced by Antica Productions and supported by the Monk Foundation. Rudyard Griffiths, Marilyn Mazurek, and Christina Campbell are the producers. The Monk Debates podcast is mixed by Kieran Lynch. The president of Antica Productions is Stuart Cox. Be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us, feel free to give us a five-star rating. Thanks again for listening.